A reading from Jonah. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Shiloh I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worshiped vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out onto the dry land. Here ends the reading of the word that has given us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Amen. 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 Sing it again. you pray with me? God of water, land, and sky, you remind us that there is nowhere that we can go where you are not present with us. We can't flee from your presence. You follow us. You are with us always. Help us to take comfort in that presence and to proclaim your love to all the world. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Isn't the story of Jonah and the fish such a a nice story? Don't you love the story of Jonah and the fish? If you're anything like me... Perhaps you tend to think about that story as a children's story. Maybe it's because it is my daughter's favorite story. She loves the story about Jonah. It's her favorite one to go to in the children's Bible. And every week I'll ask her what I should preach about this week. And every week she says, Jonah. And so this week I decided to oblige. But you know... The more that we read about Jonah, the more we realize that maybe it's not such a great children's story after all. In fact, biblical studies scholar uh, Ronald Nam suggests that if you look at it very closely and understand the context, Jonah goes from a G-rated story to an R-rated one. Let me explain. You know, of course, I'm going to tell you why. In the story, God commands Jonah to leave his home and to go to Nineveh and to proclaim repentance. Jonah thinks God is great and all, but isn't so excited about going to Nineveh. He doesn't want to go there at all. Why? Well, Nineveh was a large city, but it wasn't just any large city. At one point in time, Nineveh was the world's largest city. 
It was where the Assyrians were. And in fact, it was the Assyrian capital. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Assyrians, but they were rough folks. Scholars think that the Assyrians like to impale people, particularly Judeans like Jonah, and they believe that Assyrian soldiers would go around and take the heads of their enemies, and when they came back to Assyria, they would get paid by the head. Jonah was not anxious to have his head taken by an Assyrian soldier. Jonah also probably knew that God's prophets often had trouble. A lot of times people didn't listen to them, and a lot of times they met with kind of a devastating fate. So Jonah takes off in the opposite direction. Instead of going to Nineveh, he decides to go to Tarshish by way of Joppa. Joppa is his gateway to the west his ticket out of Dodge, and he hops on board a ship. As soon as the ship gets out to sea, it starts to rock. The ocean begins to kind of sway back and forth. There's a storm brewing that gets stronger and stronger. Now, one thing to know about sailors in this time period is that they were superstitious folk, and for good reason. Sailing was a particularly precarious profession in those days. They didn't have any nautical science that we have now. They, of course, understood the waves and the wind and how to navigate those the best they could. But whenever the waters were rough and choppy, they attributed that to an angry god. And so in the story, all of the sailors begin to pray to their respective deities, hoping that one of them will stop the storm doesn't work. And so they start unloading their cargo. They start throwing it overboard to make the ship lighter. Still doesn't work. Then they find Jonah asleep in the cargo hold, and they cast lots, a sort of ancient rolling of the dice, to figure out what was going on. And by casting lots, they somehow determine that Jonah is the cause of this storm, that Jonah has upset his God, but no matter how far away he is run, God has followed. Now, Jonah comes up with a plan, one you might not expect Jonah to come up with. He says, throw me overboard, and the sailors at first don't really want to do that, but after a while, they realize that this storm is not going to stop, and so they take Jonah, and they throw him overboard. He falls down, and he hits the water, and as he begins to sink, a fish swallows him up. Now, this is probably the part of the story you're familiar with. I should say, though, that the word is fish in Hebrew and not whale. Uh, A fish swallows him up, but you know, that's almost not the point. That tends to be what we focus on, but it's incidental. The word fish barely even occurs through the book of Jonah. The word sackcloth appears more times. The point is what happens in the midst of that fish's belly. It is there that Jonah begins to pray He prays the prayer that that DJ read for us just a moment ago. It is there in the midst of all of this chaos, having run away from God in fear, having been in the midst of the storm where he thought he would lose his life, and then being thrown overboard, and then in the gut of the fish, he begins to pray. I don't know if you've ever heard this prayer or not, It never comes up in the Revised Common Lectionary, that set of readings that many churches follow. So perhaps you haven't read it unless you've spent much time reading the book of Jonah. But I think that it is crucial to the story. In the gut of the fish, he finds his calling. He finds a closeness to God. In the midst of the chaos when everything is going wrong, 
he discovers a closeness with God. You ever felt like you're in the belly of a fish? Have you felt in the midst of this pandemic like there has been much that has gone wrong? Where in your life have you found places of hope and closeness to God? What is it in your life that has grounded you, that has filled you with hope? You know, say what you will, but I think difficult times are times when faith, when faith tends to thrive. Difficult times are times when we need the hope that faith brings. And that's what Jonah discovers in the belly of that fish. He discovers his faith and hope. Well, perhaps you remember what happens next. The fish, after three days and three nights, throws him up on the shore close to Assyria, close to Nineveh. And Jonah, now filled with faith, decides to walk right on in to Nineveh. He's not scared anymore, perhaps because after what he's been through, even time with the Assyrians doesn't seem so bad. And so he goes and he starts marching through the city, proclaiming, repent, repent, your end is near. Repent, change your ways. He marches all through the city. Then he leaves with a smug smile on his face and sits outside the city of Nineveh, ready to watch it burn. But that doesn't happen the way that Jonah expects. As it turns out, Jonah is actually a good preacher. He convinces people. He has people change their minds. You know how hard that is to do, to get someone to change their mind? It's almost impossible. Jonah should be thrilled. He is one of God's few successful prophets who convinces people, who escapes with his life. He can go back home. He can go back to living his life as he chooses. But that's not what he does. He sits outside the gates of Nineveh, cursing them. They've changed their ways. God has forgiven them. And he is furious about it. He sits there glaring at the city of Nineveh. And God has compassion on Jonah and causes this bush to begin to grow and it provides a shade so that the sun doesn't strike his head. Jonah finds some relief in that as he sits in the shade glaring at the city of Nineveh. But God sees the hate in his heart and causes that bush to shrivel up just as quickly as it had grown. And it makes Jonah absolutely furious. He is furious at the bush for shriveling up. And God says, Jonah, do you realize that you care more about the bush than you do about all the people and the animals in Nineveh. Care more about the bush than the people. It struck me as I was reading that this week about how relevant that is for us in this moment. You know anyone who cares more about the bush than the people? You know anyone who cares more about things like their right to not wear a face mask than the hundreds of thousands of people that that would protect? We often get so distracted by, by the bush that we, we miss the larger point. We miss the fact that we are called to care for one another. One of the most interesting things about the book of Jonah is that it doesn't resolve 
doesn't resolve. The book ends with Jonah furious, furious that the city of Nineveh has been allowed to remain, furious that the book is gone, the bush is gone, and the book of Jonah ends with just a question, God's question to Jonah, do you really care more about the bush than the people? Jonah's story doesn't resolve. We don't know if he becomes compassionate, if he goes back to his life, or if his hatred and his self-centeredness consumes him. We don't know the end of Jonah's story. But I do hope that in our story, we choose to be compassionate. May it be so. Amen.